Welcome back to the channel guys. Um, you know we love a bit of Fiat 500 content here and those of you who are fans of the original Fiat 500 and those of you who are fans of the more modern kind of iteration have no doubt heard of uh, the tuning company Arbart. And um, so sit back and I'm going to take you through a little bit of a history lesson in the tuning house started by Carlo Abart. Carlo Abarth and later the company that bore his name were actually responsible for tuning a huge variety of Fiat race cars, Fiat road cars, and in fact they actually kind of built a lot of their own race cars um, throughout the 50s and the 60s. Um, but in this particular episode we're going to look at a short history of Abarth and specifically its relationship with the Fiat 500 because that's kind of one of the things that we're interested in this channel. So although you probably know his name, you might not know that Carlo Abarth was actually born in 1908 and he was born in Austria. So he wasn't actually Italian, but he had an Italian father and he was christened Carl, German spelling with a K. Um, he spent quite a lot of his formative years in Italy, however. Um, he was an apprentice uh, working on designing and building motorbikes. Um, but it wasn't actually until the sort of interwar years, so the 1930s, when the economy in Austria started suffering in the same sort of way that um, a lot of Europe did during the 1930s, that he made his move to Italy permanent. And he started going by the Italianized um, version of Carl, so he became Carlo Alberto Abart. Um, and so the name that he's known by now was born. A lot of people in Europe during World War II ended up being displaced um, sort of moving around and, and he was no different. He spent quite a lot of his time, his 30s, I should say, during the war um, in Yugoslavia. Um, and after the war, he returned to Italy and he actually became a naturalised Italian citizen. And he'd been a big fan of motorcycle racing prior to the war and he kind of took that up again. And actually one of the famous things that he was involved in was a bit of a publicity stunt. Um, he raced the Orient Express, um, which for anyone that's American doesn't know about that, although you probably know about it from the uh, the Poirot story. Um, the Orient Express is one of a number of trains that um, runs from Eastern Europe um, sort of uh, across to uh, um, somewhere else in Europe, <laughs> Istanbul through to, to Europe, something along those kinds of lines. Anyway, he raced the Orient Express train on his motorbike um, trying to kind of replicate what was quite a legendary race um, back in 1930 between a Bentley, in fact driven by Bentley chairman Wolf Bonato, uh, who raced the 1930s Bentley Speed 6 against a very, very luxury train known as the Blue Train from the Côte d'Azur in France all the way up to London. Um, People aren't 100% sure whether it really happened the way the story is told, but either way, he did it. He raced the Orient Express on a motorbike. Um, he'd actually been, or, or rather his family was a long-term um, friend of the Porsche family, specifically Ferry Porsche, and um, Abart did spend some time working with him and uh, a guy called Piero Duccio, on a Formula One project um, that went under the name of Cisitalia. Uh, ultimately, that project was a failure, um, and uh, Carlo Abarth was one of the technical directors of the team, and he kind of took a bit of a of a payoff when the team folded and moved to um, Argentina. And one of the things that he got was their plans for the sports cars. He he wasn't bothered about the Formula One team, and he took the plans for the sports cars. And that they'd been working on together, and he rebadged them as a Bart Italia, and he began entering them in races in Europe. Um, and that's kind of racing's always been um, at, at the heart of what uh, a Bart has al always been about. Um, but it wasn't until 1949, when he was 41, um, that a Bart actually started the company that he's most synonymous with, which is Scuderia a Bart. Um, Scuderia is a, is a name that's kind of bandied around a lot in Italian racing circles. It literally does mean stable, but it's um, a part of a, it's, it's what's used for race teams um, or Italian auto racing teams, because I suppose it kind of harks back to, uh, to racing racehorses 
and the stables that they stay in. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, his famous logo, as you probably know, is the scorpion, which is actually literally lifted from his star sign. We've kind of established a bath was all about racing and uh, initially Scuderia a bath funded its racing activities by selling tuning parts and kits for road cars. Um, so existing road cars out there selling tuning parts, trying to fund them kind of a, a little bit like how Ferrari originally sold um, road cars just to fund his racing team. Um, and because he'd worked a lot on designing and making motorbikes, um, his specialism was designing exhausts. He was also pretty good at marketing, pretty good at publicity. Um, and he learned that during his early days in Italy after the war. And he was able to ensure that his exhaust kits were unique. They were black, they were stamped with his Scorpion brand logo, chrome tipped, and they had the backup of all of his racing pedigree and success under the Scuderia or Bath banner. And actually, his marketing game was tight. His marketing game was so strong that even though Europe was kind of in the grip of, uh, you know, post-war poverty and things like that, there was a lot of people out there with not a lot of money just trying to get back on the roads. He was actually able to sell um, his exhausts for twice the price of, of standard setup. So, say the standard setup for a Fiat was running at about two thousand lira. Um, he was selling exhausts at five thousand lira, and people were buying them. Thousands and thousands of these things were sold, and. Uh, what it meant is that his, his name was out there and, and he actually spent quite a lot of time in the late 50s and 60s working with Fiat um, on a number of different projects, both road racing, uh, land speed records, time trial cars and things like that. Um, he worked on the new 600, so um, the 600 that came out in 54, something along those kinds of lines, and the Bertoni bodied 750 a bath. Um, and really he's most famous for working with the Fiat 600. Um, it's the iconic um, Fiat Abarth. In fact, the, the 1000 TCR Berliner, um, which was a Group 5 race car from the late 60s, early 70s. Um, wide body, um, radial hemispherical heads and stuff like that. Has to be my personal all-time favourite Italian racing car. So those of you that love Ferraris, don't hate on me for that. So Fiat released the Cinquecento in 1958 um, as the result of post-war Europe. Um, it was a, an inexpensive city car and Abarth kind of saw this um, as an opportunity. It was smaller, it was lighter than the 600, it was a simple two-cylinder car, and he wanted to take it racing. Um, now, the original N-body Cinquecento had a, a 479cc two-cylinder air-cooled engine, and your 66 onwards, which are the ones that we're kind of working on, um, uh, it, on the, the rest of the channel, the F and L bodies ones are 499cc. However, Abarth had different ideas for what to do with these. Um, in 1963, he produced his first upgrade kit for the 500. So he chucked away the Weber IMB26 carb that's on there, and he put on a 28mm Solex. He upped the piston bore to 73mm, maintained the 70mm stroke crank, gave a higher lift, higher duration, higher lift, longer duration camshaft, free of flowing exhaust, one of the famous ones that he'd been uh, selling throughout Italy and kind of pushed the um, the displacement up to find 5cc and managed to get about 25 horsepower out of an engine that was a standard 17 horsepower. So it doesn't sound like a big powerhouse, but it's a big increase on what there was before. And as you can imagine from his past, this was done purely for racing purposes. Basically what he wanted to do was to sell enough of these cars via Fiat dealerships in order to qualify for the under 600cc um, Turismo racing series. And so there are 100 factory built examples that were sold via the dealership network. And he also sold tuning kits in a box. So kind of like a knockdown kit shipped all over the world. 
um, in Britain over here, uh, Radbourne Racing um, were one of the dealerships that had a license to assemble a Bath badged cars out of these kits. Um, however, anything, anyone that bought an Abarth kit that came in a box lacked the original factory build spec, which came with leather trimmed um, dash binnacle Jaeger gauges, badges, stickers, adjusted suspension and things like that. You did, however, get the engine in a box and you can actually still buy um, a very similar kit now that comes with the carburetor, that comes with the exhaust, that comes with the uh, the cams and stuff like that. Now the 595 took 20 seconds off the 0 to 60 time. Now if you can knock 20 seconds off the 0 to 60 time, I think that probably goes to show, if nothing else, how slow the 500 is in its original guise. Um, by all accounts, it's faster off the lights than a Mini of the time, and the top speed is 75 mile an hour. Now, any of the one that's driven a standard 500, you kind of top out about 58 mile an hour, possibly 60 if you've got a bit of a tailwind going downhill. So 75, that's that's quite a lot of a quite a lot of an upgrade. But that wasn't where he stopped, because um, he kind of furthered the development um, later on. In 1963, he released what's known as the 595 SS, which stands for Sprint Special. And it was a refinement of what he'd done on the 595. Got the power up to 30 horsepower, had a 34 millimeter Solex choke on there. Um, it's a slightly more flexible carburetor than the, um, the Weber that's on the standard car. Um, not least the fact that it's got an accelerator pump. He increased the compression ratio to around about nine to one and all of that served to uh, to push the power up there. Um, all original factory built Abarth engines do carry the standard 110F stamping, but they also have um, another stamp across the top that says ABA 205. Um, if you've got an original one, you'll know that that's on there, ABA 205 above your 110F. If you've got one of the ones built um, from a knockdown dealership kit, it doesn't have the ABA 205 stamp. Likewise, only the factory built cars came with an additional chassis plate. Um, you had your standard uh, chassis um, Fiat plate and there's an Abarth plate underneath it, hand stamped, so often a little bit messy. Any of you that have hand stamped a um, uh, VIN tag will know it's it's not easy to get it looking particularly neat um, and that's stamped with uh, an Abarth 105 followed by a chassis number. Um, I think there's about, well there are known to be less than 100 595 SS's factory built um, even though the production on that ran all the way up to 1971. The final iterations of the Fiat 500, which again you may have heard of the 695 and the 695 SS. So both of these had an uprated compression ratio of 10 to 1 in the SS and 9 to 1 in the 695. And obviously, as you can tell by the name 695, they are a larger displacement. And how we got the larger displacement was actually to use a 76mm piston and a 76mm stroke. So that's 6mm up from standard so it's what would be known commonly as a stroker crank um i'll be honest i don't actually know whether these were specifically cast to that specification or whether he took a 595 crank and did what's known as offset grinding um, and then used a slightly um smaller journal on the conrods whichever way he did it it gives what's known as a square engine so where you've got the equal bore to stroke ratio um, and the reason why that would have been done is it gives a good combination of reliability you get torque from lower revs because you've got a bit of a longer stroke however you've got greater air fuel volume um, from your larger bore which combined with larger valves helps make more power helps allow for larger um, a larger rev range and the 695 continued to run the single choke downdraft carb so that's that Solex 34 that you've been using previously on the 595 um, now Solex is a French manufacturer 
rather than Weber, which is an Italian one. Um, again, I'm taking a bit of a guess that because the Solex 34 is used on a large range of standard French cars, so Citroëns and Renaults and things like that, that they were cheap and easily available. So they used them, they worked. Um, the SS, again, the Sport Speciale, was about 40 horsepower. So again, we're talking more than double um, what the standard 499cc engine put out. And that uses what is the go-to performance carb for these, which is a twin choke Weber 40 DCOE um, side draft. And it sits high above the engine. Um, so it would have clashed with the top of the engine bay. Um, so therefore those standard 695 SSs actually run a slightly lowered engine mount to stop them from uh, the uh, manifold adapter from causing the um, carburetor to crash into the top of the engine compartment. Um, they also have a raised deck lid um, engine cover, whatever you want to call it, in order to get more cooling in and also to act as a, a little bit of a, an aerodynamic wing, um, kind of a, a primitive little rear spoiler on those. Um, I don't know, and I haven't been able to find in my research, the actual number of factory 695 baths, but my guess is it's going to be in the low double figures. But there's loads and loads of replica 695 SSs about, and most of those are based on a 650-126 block, um, usually using a standard stroke, 70mm um, stroke crank, and 80 millimeter pistons, which gives you around about 700 cc. Um, and like those original Labarths, people tend to run them with Weber DCOEs or Delorto, and the Delorto 40 millimeter carb is very, very similar. So, um, Carlo Labarth's relationship with Fiat went on for a number of years. That's really where we leave the 500, which is primarily what we were interested in. Um, his association with Fiat did continue. Um, and, and in fact, the, the company that he started was taken over by Fiat in 1971. Um, and like a lot of the 70s, kind of became an example of the badge engineering trend that went across Europe. And you would find in the 1970s, about badges appearing on a large number of um, members of the Fiat group. So Fiat's themselves, Lancia, Auto Bianchi's, um, all of them carried uh, about badging on. Um, it wasn't until 2007 that the brand was actually relaunched, went away for quite a while, um, and it became an independent company again in 2007, but it was under the control of Fiat and you see the Abarth badge now on a large amount of the Fiat range again. So probably some of you who are watching this um, have a current 500. You got your 595, you got your 595 SS, you got your 695 SS, you got your 695 SS 70th anniversary. You got your Biposto two seat version. Um, and if you do own one of them, they are very, very nice cars but you might not have known where the names on those badges on your cars came from. And hopefully now you know a little bit of the history of the badge and a little bit of the provenance of the car that you're driving around in. If you own a replica, original one, really, really nice. And if you own an original, I am an exceptionally jealous man. Anyway, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, give us a like. Give us a subscribe if you want to watch more garage content or if you like some of these little history lessons. Till the next time, take care.